Cool. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Yiming Zhan, and I am the lecture chair of the Yale Society of Physics Students. Together with the rest of the Yale SPS board, we would like to welcome you all to the 2021 Howard Schultz Senior Prize Lecture. Since people are still trickling in, um, I would like to say a few words about this prize lecture series before introducing our guest of honor. The Schultz Prize Lecture is named after Paul L. Schultz, who received his PhD in physics from Yale in 1937 and later joined the faculty here in 1945. During his time here, he worked on a number of atom smashing projects, including the expansion of the Yale Linear Accelerator to a 15 section 6.5 million electron volt machine. He was the director of the Electron Linear Accelerator Lab from 1961 to 1996, shortly before his death in 1977. As a professor, Howard Schultz was also especially committed to undergraduate teaching, and uh, he has helped to build the accelerator in the Bloom Physics Lab here, where undergraduate students who are taking physics lab classes will be able to use. But the Yale Society of Physics Students initiated the Schultz Prize Lecture Series about four years ago in order to honor Professor Schultz's myriad contributions to physics, and also to bring distinguished physicists to campus and to interact with the Yale undergraduate physics community. In regular years, the Schultz lecture speakers are invited to spend the day at Yale, visit the labs, and engage with undergraduate members of the SPS through a lunch, a pre-lecture reception, and a post-lecture dinner. Through these events, our students get a chance to meet distinguished guest speakers, learn about their research and journey in physics, and find role models to draw inspiration from. Together with our other annual prize lecture, the Tinsley Lecture, this is part of SPS larger mission of fostering an inclusive and supportive community of physicists at Yale. Now, after a one year hiatus in uh, 2020 due to COVID, we are incredibly grateful and excited to host Professor Monica Schleier-Smith from Stanford University virtually as our guest speaker for the third installment of this very special lecture. Monica Schleier-Smith is currently an Associate Professor of Physics at Stanford University. She received her Bachelor of Arts in 2005 from Harvard and a PhD in physics from MIT in 2011, where she worked on experimental atomic physics. She served as a postdoc fellow at Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics and Ludwig Maximilian University from 2011, before she joined the faculty of Stanford in 2013. Professor Schleier-Smith is a recent recipient of the APS Rabi Prize in Atomic Molecular and Physical Physics. In 2020, she was also named a MacArthur Fellow, um, colloquially known as the MacArthur Genius Grant. Her current research interests include understanding many-body quantum systems, using precision measurements enabled by AMO techniques, engineering and controlling novel quantum states, and the interface between AMO and quantum information. Now, without further ado, I would like to welcome Professor Shire Smith. Thank you so much for the invitation to be uh, virtually at Yale today. So the title of my talk is Choreographing Quantum Spin Dynamics with Light. And it's a talk about some work we are doing in my lab at Stanford on advancing control of interactions uh, between laser cooled atoms. And so I thought I would just start um, by saying a little bit about why we like laser cooled atoms as really kind of model systems for uh, studying quantum mechanics. Um, the state of the art um, over really over the past few years, it's actually been extraordinary. Um, uh, there have been extraordinary developments in um, controlling and manipulating um, cold atoms down to the single atom level. Here are a few pictures from um, labs around the world showing um, really each dot here is an individual uh, atom. And um, on the one hand, there's a high degree of um, control of, of single, um, single atoms and the ability to detect them. But these are also systems um, where um, every uh, atom is like every other atom. If I choose one species, let's say cesium, every cesium atom is the same as every other cesium atom. Um, and one can um, combine this single atom control with also a high degree of scalability, scaling this up to um, hundreds or even uh, a thousand atoms. So um, what are some of the uh, things that people are doing um, with these systems? Well, on the one hand, um, the fact that every cesium atom is the same as every other is the reason why we define time, the, or the second, the unit of time, in terms of an oscillation frequency in the cesium atom. Um, so as a result, um, at, at atoms, there are standard of time, the most um, extraordinarily um, uh, precise clocks are built of laser-cooled atoms. 
If you had started um, the best of these clocks when the universe began, um, it would be off by less than a second today. Um, and so those have implications, um, for example, for precision tests of fundamental physics. Um, in another direction, the sort of high degree of control um, and combined with the scalability of these systems um, is being explored um, for applications in computation. Um, and while um, building something like a universal quantum computer um, is uh, uh, st uh, still um, a vision to be worked towards, um, some nearer term work um, has focused on asking, can we use um, these systems of cold atoms, um, perhaps not to solve every computational problem, but to solve um, specific problems that are hard to do on classical computers because they're inherently quantum mechanical. Um, so for example, um, cold atoms are being used as model systems um, for uh, simulating properties of interacting electrons and materials. Um, so um, can one build simple model systems that might capture some of the essential physics um, of anything from um, superconductors to magnetic materials um, and learn something by being able to tune the properties of the atomic system in a way that would require um, in, in the solid state growing a completely different material. Um, so that direction of sort of building these simple model systems that can perhaps simulate phenomena from other areas of physics um, is one that is quite um, well established in the field of cold atoms. Particularly for this direction of, let's say, um, simulating properties of interacting electrons um, or also for applications um, in computation, one important thing is not to only be able to control individual atoms, but to um, control the ways in which these atoms interact. Um, and indeed, there's also um, um, quite good control of interactions in these systems. So for example, um, here I've shown a picture um, of um, individual atoms that are trapped in a standing wave of light that forms a lattice, um, uh, sort of a square lattice, where um, these atoms, if they're on adjacent sites of this lattice, they won't interact um, uh, because those sites are mi a micron apart. But if ad two atoms are sitting on the same site, they can interact. Um, and that um, sort of direct collisional interaction that happens when two atoms are on the same site, in this case, gives rise to some sort of checkerboard ordering of the spins of these atoms pointing up or down on opposite sites. Um, if one wants to have somewhat longer range interactions, um, one can excite atoms from their ground state to Rydberg states, um, so highly excited electronic states that allow for interactions um, on the few micron scale. And so these are some of the approaches that are being taken to control interactions and generate correlations, quantum correlations among these atoms. Now, one limitation, though, in experiments so far um, has to do with the connectivity of interactions. Um, and in particular, um, in these examples I've given you, and in, in fact, in most systems in nature, um, things interact with other things that are near them. Interactions tend to decay as a function of distance. Um, and that actually poses some limitations to what we can do with these systems. And so um, just to sort of give um, a, a kind of classical example, um, um, the internet is an example um, of the opportunity to interact in a way that is not local. Um, right, so I can easily, thanks to the internet, um, be in Palo Alto and talk to all of you in New Haven, or perhaps you're even scattered throughout um, the world for all I know, um, thanks to this sort of non-local connectivity that's provided by the internet. Um, and this, this way in which we're connected and able to easily talk across the globe um, really governs kind of the, the flow of information, right? Um, in a way where sort of, you know, in some um, olden times, information sort of traveled between neighbors, um, uh, sort of the common wisdom that developed, um, developed in, in a particular community that was spatially localized. Um, but now, particularly in this pandemic era, I've sort of realized that the network of people I'm interacting with is some network of physicists across the globe. Um, and that changes the way that collaborations form and that common wisdom develops. So similarly, um, in quantum systems, um, the connectivity provided by interactions um, is very important. And so, for example, here I've shown you kind of two examples um, of ways that some collection of quantum bits, let's say, might interact. Um, so those are the red dots here. In the one case, I've positioned them on a site, the sites of a lattice um, and um, uh, assumed that nearest neighbors interact. And it turns out that in this type of a system, for example, um, one natural quantum state that might arise as a function of these interactions um, is something known as a cluster state, which is a resource for universal quantum computation. 
Um, if you had the same type of interaction, except um, that the connectivity is different, every atom talks to every other atom, it turns out that this naturally gives rise to a class of states known as um, squeeze states, which are resources for enhanced um, sensing and uh, enhanced uh, clocks. So um, just by sort of changing the connectivity of the interactions, um, you, you might generate quantum states that are resources for different types of applications. So those are two simple examples. Um, but one of the things that um, I've sort of been dreaming of being able to do is to explore if you could make other graphs of interactions, um, perhaps that would open up some, some new opportunities. And the reason to sort of expect that is that the structure of interactions in a quantum system governs the form of quantum entanglement that arises in the system. So what do I mean by entanglement? Um, actually, I recently had um, the uh, pleasure of getting to work with a professional animator um, to animate my uh, one and a half minute description of what I mean when I say entanglement. Um, so here goes, here's a brief little video. The simplest quantum system is a quantum bit, which like a classical bit can be in the zero state or the one state. The remarkable thing about a quantum bit is that it doesn't need to be in just the zero state or the one state. It can be in what's called a, a superposition of the two. Fundamentally, it's unknown and unknowable whether the qubit is in the zero state or the one state until a measurement is performed. And when the measurement per is performed, it's almost like it has to decide. So I like to use kind of the analogy of a, a coin, right? A coin is a system with two states, heads and tails. And the superposition is a little bit like a coin that's floating in midair and it hasn't decided whether it's going to land heads or tail. So now the really neat thing though, is that in a quantum system, you can have a phenomenon that's equivalent to me tossing a coin and you tossing a coin. And we repeat this experiment a hundred times. And every time I get heads, you get heads. And every time I get tails, you get tails. But if I look at my tosses alone, the outcome always looks flat random. So there's this randomness, but there are correlations in the randomness. And that tells us that there's some information that I don't have, my coin toss looks random, you don't have it. But when we compare notes, there's actually some information there and not just randomness. So this idea of having information that's encoded in correlations, this is known as entanglement. And this is really the key resource for quantum technologies. Right. So, yeah. So in quantum mechanics, we can have information that, you know, that I don't have here in Palo Alto that you don't have in New Haven, but that when we somehow compare notes, there's in, we find there's information that's delocalized across the United States in principle. Right. So it tells us information doesn't have to be in one place. Information can be non-local. Um, but in order to efficiently um, generate this entanglement, which is this, this key resource, um, we would like to have more control over the structure of interactions, which governs the way in which entanglement forms. Um, so my dream is to have one day in the lab something like kind of a, a, a arbitrary waveform generator for quantum states, um, or at least for perhaps interactions where I can press some buttons and, and start to play with how the form of interactions governs the quantum states that we can make and their applications. Um, so that, uh, you know, might seem a little bit far-fetched. Um, but one thing um, that I've already sort of hinted at for you is that um, in these systems of cold atoms, we can actually have quite a high degree of control um, using laser light. Um, so here are um, some pictures I kind of flashed up before that are really showing actually each atom here is trapped at the focus of a laser beam. And by controlling the spatial positions of, of those um, focused laser beams, one can control um, the patterns in which these atoms are trapped. Um, but, uh, and, and, and sort of one key thing I want to point out is the sort of typical spacing between these atoms is on the kind of micron scale set by the wavelength of light. Um, what we have been working on my lab is something um, complementary to this, which is saying, um, uh, can we take this high degree of control over atoms that we have with laser light, but use the light actually to control the interactions between the atoms? Um, and can we sort of reach a similar degree of programmability of the interactions and not just the positions? Um, and so there are actually two different kind of platforms that we work in my lab uh, with in my lab. One that I touched on before um, is, is um, one where atoms are excited to Rydberg states where the electron cloud is large and polarizable. And that gives rise to interactions on kind of the few micron scale that still decay with distance. 
Um, that won't be the focus of my talk today. Um, today I'll talk about um, at sort of having even more non-local interactions where the connectivity is given by letting atoms talk to each other with the aid of photons that get scattered between these atoms and convey information between them. Um, and uh, so uh, that allows for having really these sort of highly non-local types of interactions, a bit like what we're doing right now over the internet. Um, so why would you want to do that? Um, one reason has to do with, with quantum control. If you can have these non-local interactions, you can perhaps more efficiently generate non-local correlations and entanglement and useful quantum states for a range of applications um, from enhanced sensing to computation. Um, another direction has to do with um, this area of this direction of simulating phenomena from other areas of physics. I mentioned examples um, inspired by kind of materials and condensed matter physics, um, but we'll also start to explore, can you, um, by having more exotic structures of interactions, um, perhaps simulate some ideas coming from uh, the, the area of quantum gravity? We'll get to that later. Um, and another direction is that um, maybe you'd like to use your quantum system um, to solve um, some real world classical optimization problem. And the general concept is that there are a wide range of um, optimization problems that can be mapped to minimizing the energy of some interacting system of, of qubits or spins. Um, and so perhaps if you can build the system with the correct form of interactions, that will give you some way of steering the system to the state that solves your problem. Um, I'm going to start with just an example, actually, from this optimization area, because it's one of the ones you might be likely to read about if you read the news or surf the internet. So there are a range of companies that will tell you that they are building quantum computers that will solve your scheduling or logistics problems, help you more efficiently um, uh, uh, optimize your fleet operations for holiday deliveries. Um, and when I read about these things, I always want, first of all, there's sort of lots of active research going on and asking, can quantum systems speed up these problems? What role would entanglement play? I always wondered, how do you map like a real world problem like this onto a physical system? So here's just like one concrete example of this. Um, so here's a problem that actually I um, encounter fairly regularly in daily life, which is um, I'm going grocery shopping and I have a collection of objects um, with some specified weights. Um, and the question is, um, I would like to divide these objects into two groups of equal weight so that I can, you know, uh, um, most efficiently carry my groceries. Um, so I have these n objects with specified weights, and the object is to partition them into two groups that would balance a scale. So as a physicist, um, I am going to map this to um, a spin problem. If, an, if uh, an object is going to go into the bag on, on the right here, um, I'll indicate that by a spin pointing right. If it's going to go in the bag on the left, I'll indicate that by a spin pointing to the left. We'll call those the plus z and minus z directions. And what I would like to do is minimize the imbalance um, on this scale, which is some weighted sum of values sz that you can think of as being, let's say, um, plus one if the spin points this way, minus one if it points the other way. So um, I could minimize this imbalance, or equivalently, I could minimize the square of the imbalance. Um, and um, so maybe what I would like to do is build a system whose energy corresponds to this quantity fz squared. And when I look at this, um, what does this look like? It's some um, sum of products of the spins, um, of the individual spins, with some uh, uh, um, couplings j that have to do with the weights. Um, but the key thing here is, so this looks like an interacting system, right? The energy should depend on whether a pair of spins is aligned or anti-aligned. Um, and um, there are terms for arbitrary pairs of spins. So these are some lo long range, non-local interactions. Okay, so if I'd like to be able to explore this, some tools I need are some way of encoding a spin, some way of making them interact non-locally, and hopefully some way of programming the structure of interactions. Okay, so um, in, in my system of cold atoms, um, uh, we can have we'll have you know, two internal states um, represent the spin being up or down. Um, and if we want to have some long range interactions between these spins, um, the way that we can go about doing this, um, here's one way we could go about doing this. Um, imagine I have a, a spin up atom and I can have a process where that atom um, flips its spin by emitting a photon. And another atom absorbs that photon and flips its spin. So then um, this photon basically mediates a process, a pairwise process of spin exchange. Um, and because you know, light travels 
at the speed of light, which for my purposes in the lab is essentially instantaneous, um, this interaction um, can basically um, happen over, over long distances um, uh, in a way that's effectively non-local. So one thing we need to be careful about is I really want this emitted photon to be absorbed by another atom and not fly off in a random direction. Um, and so actually what we do is we place our atoms between two mirrors that form what's called an optical resonator. Um, and any light that's emitted between these two mirrors um, uh, undergoes constructive interference that enhances the probability that an atom, that uh, a photon that's emitted sort of into this resonator will interact again with another atom as opposed to a photon just being emitted in some random direction. So this resonator allows us to generate um, strong interactions um, between the atoms and not um, lose the photons. Um, so this general approach actually of photon mediated interactions is used in a range of different physical systems. Um, there's been um, beautiful work here at Yale um, on photon mediated interactions um, where the photons are microwave photons and they're um, allowing superconducting qubits to interact. Um, uh, microwave photons can also be used to couple, let's say, quantum dots. Optical photons um, have been used to generate interactions both between solid state spins um, coupled to um, nanostructured waveguides. Um, or in the type of experiment I'll talk about, um, again, our spins are encoded in these, these cold atoms. Um, and the resonator is really formed by sort of two macroscopic mirrors um, placed end to end. Um, and depending on your application, you might choose different ones of these platforms. Um, these uh, superconducting systems have a strong track record already in um, quantum gates and quantum computing applications. Um, optical photons are of interest for quantum networking applications. Um, and also these directions in um, engineering entangled states that are useful for um, quantum sensing and for simulations. Um, one thing that I want to point out about the atomic systems is kind of the scalability. So there are experiments being done with two atoms um, that are individually detected or experiments being done with um, 10 to the 5 atoms. Um, the 10 to the 5 atoms can be useful if you're sort of exploring, let's say, precision measurement applications where you get more statistics by having more atoms present. Um, and so at, in this kind of range of, of many atoms interacting with light, um, just to give a flavor of things that have been done, um, one thing that's been done is using the light to generate a class of entangled states um, known as a squeezed state. And what's sort of shown in one of these pictures here is some kind of a blob that indicates um, the, the total spin of this collection of, um, let's say, 10 to the 5 atoms um, that's pointing in some direction on a sphere. And I've shown some Gaussian uncertainty, that's some quantum uncertainty that has to do with the fact that measuring the state of one of these atoms is a bit like that coin toss. There's some randomness in the coin toss. Um, but it turns out by generating interactions between the atoms, um, which generate entanglements of so these correlations in the coin toss, um, it's possible to reduce these quantum fluctuations in a particular direction. And that can be used to make a more precise, um, let's say, atomic clock um, or a more precise magnetometer if you're using the spins to perhaps measure a magnetic field. Um, so those are, um, that's kind of one direction that's um, already quite well explored in these systems, particularly um, using uh, the interactions to generate entangled states that can enhance atomic clocks. Um, in another direction, um, these systems are already ha already have some track record in this area of quantum simulation, so simulating phenomena from other areas of, of physics, um, um, ranging, for example, from um, super solid phases um, inspired by uh, uh, condensed matter systems um, uh, to topological states of light using um, atoms to actually allow photons to interact. Um, so there are a number of different directions that are um, already being explored in quantum simulation. Um, one direction I'll get to is maybe simulating phenomena connected to gravity. Um, one thing that, that I want to kind of highlight is to me these two directions, um, engineering specified entangled states um, and this area of simulation are in some sense two sides of the same uh, coin. Um, both of them in some way have to do with um, under, either generating or understanding uh, quantum entanglement. Um, and on the left-hand side, um, this area of sort of generating specific quantum states, like these squeeze states, um, in some sense, on the one hand, it's a demonstration that these interactions mediated by light um, can generate quantum correlations. 
Um, but one thing I want to point out is the fact that I'm able to even draw a picture of a quantum state that I told you involves 100,000 100, atoms is rather remarkable because in general, um, fitting a description of a for the full quantum state of even tens of, um, of, of, of spins on a, on a, is not possible on sort of a large supercomputer. So why is it that I can fit a description of this system into a, a simple picture? Well, it has to do with the fact that in some sense, this is again, a relatively simple class of state where we started with all of these spins aligned um, and all that we've manipulated are sort of some fluctuations around the average. Um, in the broader case, um, in this sort of area of quantum simulation, the goal is to have access to sort of richer quantum states where one actually can't calculate perhaps what will happen um, in the system or, or what the properties of the system are, um, but your, your quantum simulator will allow you to, to um, study the system in a regime where you can't calculate the dynamics. Um, so in some sense, one question that um, I've always kind of wondered is, in this regime of more complex interacting quantum systems, is it really hopeless to try to visualize the system? Because if you can draw a picture, that can actually be helpful um, to understand the properties and perhaps the useful features of the quantum correlations. Um, so I was actually really fascinated when I learned um, that there are some ideas coming from people who think about the connections between quantum mechanics and gravity for how in certain cases one might be able to have a way of visualizing entanglement in more complex quantum systems. Um, and the general concept is that if I have some collection of, um, of uh, let's say atoms or quantum bits um, that uh, lives in D spatial dimensions, in this case, D is one, um, uh, I've, I've drawn kind of a chain, um, I've connected it in a ring, but it's essentially a one dimensional system. Um, the general concept is that in certain cases, um, the structure of entanglement and correlations um, in this one dimensional system can actually be visualized um, by mapping this to a higher dimensional system that has um, space time curvature and gra arising from gravity. And the idea is that somehow the curvature of the space encodes something about um, the strength of correlations in, in, in terms of the distance um, between sites in this lower dimensional system. So the general idea is that in, in certain cases, the structure of entanglement can be encoded in some geometry of a higher dimensional space. So when I learned about that, I was curious, are there model systems where one could actually probe this in experiments and perhaps learn something from this geometrical picture about the quantum system? Um, and if so, um, could these ideas from gravity sort of help us um, understand and visualize a, wide, a wider range of interacting quantum systems where generically drawing simple pictures is not, is not easy? Um, if you want to start to explore that, you need some prediction coming from this uh, direction of, of gravity. Um, and one prediction um, that has been made has to do with what would a quantum system, how would a quantum system behave if under this duality, it is equivalent to a black hole. And in particular, um, the concept is that in a black hole, there was for a long time a problem that information seems to be lost when it falls into a black hole. But there's a quantum mechanical picture where what's happening really is that information is just becoming kind of hidden in complex correlations and entanglement between many degrees of freedom of an interacting system. And to explain this information loss problem, this information needs to be scrambled or sort of hidden in these correlations um, in a time that is exponentially fast. And when sort of, so, you know, that, that's a concrete prediction about what a quantum system would behave like if it were like a black hole. And when people write down sort of toy models to try to explain um, uh, uh, this phenomenon of information scrambling, they look very weird to an experimentalist. So they involve things like particles that can hop in a completely non-local fashion. Um, or perhaps particles um, that move um, uh, not in a normal sort of Euclidean space, but on, a, on some kind of a tree graph, um, uh, some totally different type of geometry. Okay, and so we'll ask, you know, can we start to build systems like this in the lab? Let's start with these weird non-locally hopping particles. So I told you before that in principle, it's possible to use light um, to sort of mediate processes where spin excitations hop between distant, at distant atoms, right? So I don't know how to make massive particles hop in a non-local fashion, but these spin excitations, we can make them hop in a way that is mediated by light. Um, and experimentally, if we want to do that in sort of a well-controlled fashion, um, 
the, the way that we do this is we have a process where we drive an optical resonator that I introduced before with a laser field. And when the light is on, you can have a process where basically an atom absorbs a photon from the laser field and emits a photon into the cavity, which in turn interacts with another atom. And that process generates pairwise spin exchange processes that are controlled by this laser field. Okay. Um, so kind of drawing, drawing here, some diagram showing initially I had a spin excitation in the atom on the right. When I turn on this purple laser field, I can drive a process where that spin excitation gets converted into a photon in the cavity and then back into um, a spin excitation in the other atom. So we can do this in the lab. Um, and in the lab, um, the experiment li literally involves sort of two mirrors that are five centimeters apart that generate this optical resonator. And in this um, simplest case, um, we trap atoms in essentially a standing wave of light between those two mirrors. So the positions of the atoms themselves are fixed, um, but the spin excitations can move around. So here's an experiment where we initially created some spin excitations in this region that I call A. So the horizontal axis is position in our cloud of atoms, the vertical axis is time. And as a function of time, when we, after we turn on the light, you see these spin excitations show up in this different place B and hop back. Um, at any fixed time, you can see some oscillations. That's an indication of quantum coherence in the system. Um, and one other thing that sort of immediately jumps out at me in this picture is that these spin excitations don't just sort of travel outward from A, they suddenly show up in this place B. Um, and so, this is, so there's something non-local going on here. Um, and it turns out this whole picture is something we can actually understand very well um, if we know the local density of our atomic cloud and the local intensity of the light field. That sort of, um, it in this particular picture, the reason the spin excitations showed up at this region B is that the light intensity happens to be strongest here. So we can understand that well. Um, it's not yet the function generator I described. Um, we'd like to have some control over the structure of the interactions. So um, some of the knobs we would like for our function generator are control over the spatial structure. Um, can every atom talk to every other one? Um, which was the case in the, pic the data I showed before. Or um, do you perhaps have some other structure of interactions that could be useful for um, anything from um, encoding specific optimization problems to um, uh, building these fast scramblers? Okay, so we'd like to control the spatial structure. Some other things you might want control over are the form of the interactions. Do we have this sort of flip-flop effect where spin excitations hop between different atoms? Or do you have what I described um, earlier on, something where the Z components of the spins want to align or anti-align? So that would be called, this, um, this second case would be called an Ising interaction. Um, since I'll use this term, I'll just mention if you have this, this process where the spin excitations can hop, um, that's actually equivalent to saying the energy depends on whether the spins are aligned or anti-aligned in the XY plane. So that I'll call an XY interaction. Um, so we might want to control, is it XY or Ising? Um, and maybe we want to control the sign of the interaction. Do the spins want to align or do they want to anti-align? Um, so ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic. Okay. So first, just to kind of give a flavor for this, this toolbox, I'll show um, a little bit about controlling the form and the sign of the interaction um, in the simple case where every atom talks to every other, and then we'll come back to the spatial structure. Okay. So um, if every atom talks to every other, then... Um, uh, this gives me a graph of interactions that's a bit like the one I showed before in this number part in this um, the grocery shopping example, where I can sort of express the energy of the system in terms of some weighted sum of the individual spins. Um, and it turns out, so that's what we sort of most naturally get in this experiment. Um, and in that simple case, um, one thing that we can already do in the direction of the function generator is we can control um, are the interactions between the Z components of the spins. Um, or between the X and Y components of the spins. It turns out we can control that just by the angle of a magnetic field relative to the axis of our resonator. Um, and do the spins want to align or to anti-align? Um, so just to give a flavor of things we can do with that, um, here's an example where we sort of um, probe, first of all, um, can we in fact control is the interaction ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic? Do the spins want to align or anti-align? Um, and the way that we can do that is we want some way of sort of preparing a low energy state of the system and seeing how the spins behave. Um, what's easy for us to do in the lab is prepare a state where the spins are all aligned with a magnetic field. Um, and so, for example, just to kind of orient you, if I, um, I initialize the system with a magnetic field um, pointing along, let's say, 
um, the z-direction, and I can slowly sweep that field, and the spins should follow um, just by that's staying in the low energy state aligned with the field. So here's an example where I sort of varied the tilt of the field. That's this vertical axis here. Red shows whether the spins are pointing up and down, and you can see them following. Um, so as I vary the tilt of the field, they go from blue, which is down, to red, which is up. If I do this same thing in the presence of interactions, um, and let's take these Ising interactions, which they, means the Z components want to either align or anti-align, um, this sort of smooth dependence um, on the Z field changes into a very sharp edge, in this case where the spins want to align, these ferromagnetic interactions. And that's saying basically, um, if I have the slightest tilt in the Z field, the spins either all align down or all align up because they want to stay aligned with each other. And you see the opposite behavior if the interactions, if I change the sign of the interaction, which I can do just by my laser frequency. Um, I can kind of summarize this in the plot of the magnetic susceptibility of my system. This knife edge showing the spins either all want to tilt down or all want to tilt up means the spins are highly susceptible to this, this applied magnetic field. And that's shown by this divergence at, at some critical sort of strength of this Ising interaction. Interestingly, if you do the same thing, but don't have the Ising interactions, but what I call the XY interactions, the X and Y components of the spins want to um, either align or anti-align. This magnetic susceptibility is the mirror image of what I got for the case of Ising interactions. So ferromagnetic Ising interactions, the spins want to align or anti-align along Z, are the same actually in some sense as anti-ferromagnetic interactions in the XY plane. So why is that actually? Why do we see that symmetry? Um, well, actually you can kind of understand this by drawing some picture of the energies of the spins as a function of their, um, uh, the total magnetization. If the system, um, if it's correct to say what matters is some kind of total sum or weighted sum of the spins. Um, and I can draw a comparison. The energy is as a function of sort of the orientation of the spins. They don't look the same, but they do look the same if you restrict yourself to a surface where the length of the spin is fixed. And so that explains actually the symmetry um, between these two cases of Ising interactions of one sign, XY interactions of the other. So that symmetry is present, for example, if the system is behaving like a single large spin whose length can't change. But actually, in the more general case, if, the, if I really have a many-body system with individual spins that can act independently, um, then one of the things you'll notice is that if I, for example, had some way for the spins to dephase by getting shorter, um, in the case of the XY interactions, there would be an energy penalty. These interactions in the XY plane favor the spins staying aligned. And so actually it should be harder to make the spins anti-align and dephase um, in the case of these XY interactions. And that actually can be useful if you want to sort of protect the coherence of the system, keep the spins aligned, maybe because you're trying to use them to sense a magnetic field, let's say. Um, so just to kind of illustrate that, here's an experiment where we look at the dynamics in the presence of some um, spatially varying magnetic field in the absence of interactions, this, some spiral texture evolves in the system because of the magnetic field gradient. But if you turn on interactions, um, these XY interactions, the spins actually all want to stay aligned. And so this actually, this picture looks boring. The color isn't changing because the phase isn't winding. Um, that's not true for the interactions in the Z direction, these Ising interactions. So we actually, this is an example where um, it being able to control the type of interaction allows us to realize this, this form of interaction that actually protects the coherence of the spins and helps them stay aligned. Um, and so, so again, the way to think about this is um, these interactions are creating an energy cost for changing the length of this total spin. Um, and that actually has some applications if you want to use these, um, the system um, for quantum sensing applications, particularly if you want the light to be there to generate interactions that can produce entanglement um, if you choose the right form of interaction, it can at the same time help preserve um, the length of the spin that's useful um, in quantum sensing applications. So that's um, just kind of one example of things you can do with control over the form of the interactions in this system. Um, I kind of hinted that one reason it's useful if you want to also use the light um, to generate an entangled state um, let me give you a flavor of one way you might actually do that in this system. And I gave some examples before. There have been a number of experiments harnessing these photon-mediated interactions to generate um, entangled states. Um, but there's actually a new approach that we've um, been exploring in our system. Um, and uh, so let me, let me actually just say a little bit about this. So to, to tell you about this, I need to actually add one piece of information I kind of hid before. 
which is in our experiment, we have um, each atom has three internal states, the minus one state, the zero state, and the one state. Um, and so it's a spin one system. And one simple thing we can do is initiate all of the atoms in the um, m equals zero state, which classically sort of you would say there's no average magnetization to the system. And you might even think if you're sort of a classical physicist that nothing should happen if I turn on the light field, um, if what couples to sort of the, the light is somehow the magnetization of the atoms. Um, but actually, um, if, if you have, let's say, this um, flip-flop type of an interaction um, in the spin one system, what can happen is two zero atoms can get converted to a pair of plus one and minus one atoms. Um, and if you sort of do the same experiment 100 times, start with all atoms in the zero state, look at the number of minus one and plus one atoms, um, what we see are there are large fluctuations in the number of atoms in the two states, um, but the number is always correlated. When there are more minus one atoms, there are more plus one atoms. Um, and what we understand is that what's going on is this is a process where essentially there's an interaction between two zero atoms that gives a plus one and a minus one atom in a similar way to actually things that have been observed in the past by direct collisions. Two zero atoms collide and give a plus one minus one pair. Um, in our case, what's happening is not direct collisions. Um, it's mediated by photons. Um, but this is sort of, um, it's an analogy to processes um, that uh, have also sort of to the generation of, for example, correlated photon pairs and nonlinear optics. It's a process for generating correlated atom pairs um, that, again, are sort of a resource. There's these correlations in the randomness are a resource um, potentially for enhanced sensing. Um, um, and a way of, of generating useful entangled states. But what we would like to do is be able to control actually which atoms are paired with which, which others. So sort of in the simplest case, any atom can talk to any other. Um, but the neat new feature we have is because we can do this with light, um, you can start to ask, can I control the spatial structure of the correlations in this system? OK, and so to investigate that, we work now with a, an array of atomic ensembles. Um, in this example, I have, um, let's say, 18 little clouds of atoms um, in a discrete array. And we'd like to see how far we can come in controlling which cloud of atoms talks to which other. Um, and so ideally, maybe you'd like to arbitrarily control that. Let's modestly say, let's ca ask, can we control the interactions as a function of distance? That would allow us to start controlling the spatial structure of the correlations in this system. OK, so it turns out in the simplest case, every atom talks to every other. If we don't want that to happen um, because we want more control, what we can do is apply a magnetic field gradient across the system. And in this magnetic field gradient, that process where you generate a plus one minus one pair um, is only resonant if two atoms are sitting on the same site, right? If they're sitting at a distance apart, then the, there's an energy um, cost to creating a pair of atoms in the plus one and the minus one state because of the magnetic field gradient. Um, so the key point is that this, if we sort of turn on the interactions in the system, generate these plus one minus one pairs and look at correlations between the number of plus one atoms on site I and the number of minus one atoms on site J, you'll see correlations only on this diagonal, which says these pairs are only forming on a single site. But if we want to now turn on interactions at a particular distance, what we can do is send in two different frequencies of light corresponding to two different photon energies. And now if we absorb a photon at one of these frequencies and emit at the other frequency, that allows you to bridge the cost of generating a pair at a particular distance. And so by controlling the frequency that's present in this spectrum of our laser field, we can control the distance at which interactions are present. And indeed, as we scan the laser frequency and look at sort of correlations as a function of distance, you see the distance where we observe these correlations between the plus one and minus one atoms tracks. Okay, so by controlling, um, and there's actually very fine control. So you can decide, do I have interactions at a distance of 10 sites or nine sites or 11 sites just by controlling the laser frequency. So that generalizes because it's easy to control the, freq the, the modulation, it's easy to modulate the intensity of our laser field um, and thereby control actually what frequencies are present. So just to kind of give another example of this, if you'd like to, if you add a higher frequency modulation, um, so you intensity modulate the laser field at some higher frequency, 
you can um, not only connect, let's say, um, nearest neighbors, but also connect essentially the ends of our chain. Um, so here's an example where basically just by adding some additional pulsing to our waveform, we can go from something where we have a, this one dimensional chain to something where we connect the ends of the chain and have effectively a ring. Um, so there are interactions here at a distance of one site, but also at a distance of 17 sites in a chain of 18. Um, so that starts to show that the geometry of this graph that we generate doesn't need to be the same as the physical geometry that we have in the lab. Um, Okay, so I'm kind of indicating to you that there's some control um, over, over this geometry, but we can even sort of take it a step further and ask, um, can you directly from the measured correlations reconstruct what effectively the geometry of the system is? Um, and so uh, we uh, essentially you know, measure some correlations between different spins on different sites. And then um, we can ask if we assume that correlations decay in some way as a function of distance in some effective geometry, what is the best fit position of the sites or the best fit positions of the sites to explain these correlations? Um, and so just in the sort of a black box reconstruction, what pops out is this ring. It has a bit of a kink. It's an experiment. It's not perfect, but it's clearly a ring. And I should emphasize actually, my students here have really drawn in every possible bond between any pair of sites. Um, but the bonds are sort of more opaque if the correlations are strong and what pops out is this ring. Okay, so now you can try this with a few other structures of interactions. For example, if I turn on interactions at a distance of every three sites, um, you can try to predict what is the geometry that will pop out. So you can think about that for a moment. And what we see are basically three decoupled chains. And this actually makes sense. I could have drawn this as these three rows um, uh, with 0, 3, 6, and so forth, interacting 1, 4, 7, and, and so forth. Um, so OK, so that starts to make sense. Let's do something a little bit fancier. Um, we can have nearest neighbor interactions and interactions at a distance of nine sites. While we're at it, we can also, at each distance, control the sign of the interaction. So for fun here, we said, let's make them ferromagnetic at one distance, anti-ferromagnetic at another. Um, and measure the correlations and what pops out when you reconstruct the geometry turns out to be a Mobius strip. Um, so, uh, so here the, the sort of as you go along this wheel here, you're going along kind of the single edge of the strip, um, which comes back to the original point because of the twist. Um, and if you kind of ask what are the spins doing, um, you can understand this as the neighbors are almost aligned, but there's a sort of phase winding as you go once around the, the single edge of the strip or once around this wheel, um, such that um, across the strip, the spins are anti-aligned. So we can kind of understand that as some spin texture that's forming in the cloud. Okay, and you can play games with different modulation waveforms to realize um, a cylinder without a twist, um, various types of um, uh, ladder geometries. Um, and this actually you can now take in a number of different directions. Um, so um, it turns out this could be a nice starting point for studying um, models inspired by um, um, sort of solid state magnetic materials um, of, of um, what happens when I have anti-ferromagnetic interactions that compete in a way that it's maybe not obvious what the lowest energy state is. Um, this, is this is known as frustration. Um, that could be explored. Um, the fact that the interactions change sign as a function of distance um, for the sort of condensed matter physicists that shows up in um, models of spin glasses. Um, one could actually use control of the phase of the modulation at different length scales to make effective magnetic fields for the spin excitations. Um, so lots of different directions this could go. Some of the ideas are sort of inspired by things one can do in other platforms. But I wanted to say one thing that sort of is not easy to do in other platforms. Um, and that um, came about from thinking about, could you probe some of these ideas coming from the area of, of quantum gravity? Um, so I actually have to say, I don't know much about gravity myself, um, but I was very fortunate to collaborate with um, Steve Gubser, um, a theorist at Princeton. He sadly passed away in a climbing accident a couple of years ago. Um, but not before teaching me quite a lot about um, uh, sort of his vision for understanding what the mathematical structure is that might underlie the reality that we experience as smooth space time, but which we have reason to believe is fundamentally discrete because of quantum mechanics and the existence of a, of a Planck length as a natural length scale cutoff. Um, and so Steve actually formulated a version of this um, holographic duality that I in introduced before. Um, where one has a physical system 
that's one dimensional living on kind of the leaves of a tree graph. And the tree graph can actually be viewed as this bulk geometry that encodes something about the structure of correlations in the physical system. So the idea is um, if I uh, have, have this tree graph, there are n sites along the boundary, but the depth of the tree is only logarithmic in the size of the boundary. Um, if I sort of wrap that up and, and show it on a disk, um, the circumference scales as n, but the radius goes only as log n, so this must be curved in some way. Um, so this is kind of a disc discretized model for, for curved space and gravity. Um, okay, so perhaps if you can study quantum mechanics on a tree graph, um, that's a starting point for exploring a model of quantum gravity. Um, and actually, there's sort of a structure of interactions that we had thought about that should naturally give rise to something like this tree graph. Um, and the basic idea is that if you have interactions at distances that are powers of two, and you have some control over whether those interactions shrink with distance or grow with distance, if they shrink with distance, it's not so different from just having the dominant interaction is between nearest neighbors. It's sort of like this linear chain. But it turns out if they grow with distance, um, there's reason to believe that the best way to think about this system is that the sites are leaves on a tree graph that captures something about the effective distance between them. So um, let me just illustrate. So, so we said, let's just see, can we do this in the experiment? Oh, sorry, I should, so there, these are two very different geometries. Um, and the conjecture is that at some point between them, um, everything is strongly connected to everything and you might observe this fast scrambling. So that was some of our motivation for exploring this. Um, so we said, okay, good, now we have the tools. Let's program in this structure of interactions where there are um, sites that are separated by distances that are powers of two interact. And if the interactions grow with distance, if you look, measure the spin correlations in the system, um, they uh, show some weird non-monotonic behavior. Correlations are strong between at a distance of eight sites, four sites, two sites. Um, if the system is really behaving like a tree graph, it turns out there's a natural way to rearrange the sites um, uh, such that uh, essentially the, the, the positions of the leaves on the tree are obtained by taking the site number and writing it in binary and reversing the order of the bits. And if we do that, then this correlation plot starts to look much more structured. It has a sort of hierarchical structure. It shows some blocks that correspond to the different levels in the tree graph. And there's a correct notion of distance measured along the tree as a function of which these, the strength of the correlation smoothly decays. So that shows actually the system is behaving as though the sites were leaves on this tree. And you can take this one step further and say, um, earlier I kind of just um, in a black box way from the data tried to reconstruct the effective geometry of the system. If you do that here, if you just sort of reconstruct the positions of the sites based on the strength of correlations, um, this is what we get for these tree-like interactions if they, that grow with distance. This is what we get when the interactions shrink with distance. But now we can take one more step and draw some bonds between the sites that are most strongly correlated. And if we do that iteratively, join the sites that are most strongly correlated, treat those as a larger site, connect them again, um, what shows up actually is precisely this sort of tree structure. Um, and again, so the tree, this is not like the Mobius strip, I was, each, ed, each vertex was a site. Here, these vertices are not the physical system. This is this sort of effective extra dimension that's showing up to express, explain the structure of the quantum correlations. Um, Whereas if interactions decay with distance, I don't have this, this additional dimension, I just have a ring. So um, this is kind of starting to get at this idea perhaps of probing this, um, this uh, extra dimension that's describing something about the structure of correlations in the quantum system. Um, and lastly, um, uh, we can even start to ask um, if you sort of cut the system in half, how strongly correlated are the two halves? And you can try different ways of cutting the system. If you cut the system according to the physical geometry, um, that correctly gives you sort of two minimally correlated halves of the system um, in the case where interactions decay with distance. But in the case where interactions grow with distance, you actually have to cut according to the tree for to have two weakly correlated halves. Um, and, and lastly, if sort of um, interactions are flat with distance, there's no way of cutting the system such that the two halves are only weakly correlated. And that's sort of where everything is talking to everything. And perhaps that would be conducive to seeing this fast scrambling behavior. Okay, so um, I've kind of shown you um, a few different tools for controlling um, the structure, really programming the structure of interactions. 
um, in this system of cold atoms. Um, we can control the signs of the interaction. Do the spins want to align or anti-align the form of the interactions and realize a range of different interaction graphs. And um, we are, skip that, we're excited about the possibility of um, using these tools um, for a number of different directions, um, going deeper into exploring um, perhaps these connections to quantum gravity, um, studying uh, uh, these optimization problems, asking can we really now map um, some interesting optimization problem onto finding the lowest energy state of this interacting spin system, um, and perhaps even have a scenario where um, the dynamically generated spin correlations um, tell you something about this lowest energy state. Um, there are open questions about whether and how one can get a quantum advantage um, um, by um, you know, the specific method I've shown you here, um, although there are sort of, um, if you're interested in one um, approach that actually we know gives some advantage, um, theoretically, that could be explored in systems like this. Um, um, that's, um, we've been thinking about a way of actually applying a known quantum algorithm um, for specifically that partitioning problem I described earlier. So that's a, a direction that you can read about here. Um, and lastly, we'd love to sort of um, go deeper into measuring actually entanglement between these different spatial modes um, and asking, for example, can you optimize the pattern of quantum correlations to optimally, say, um, detect some particular spatial pattern in a magnetic field, um, optimize the, the state for quantum sensing applications. So with that, um, I want to thank uh, the team of people who did these experiments, particularly Eric Cooper, Avakar Parawal, and Philip Kunkel, um, uh, did the latest cavity QED experiments that I showed on engineering the graph of interactions, um, building on work by Emily Davis and Greg Benson, who were um, former PhD students in the group. So um, I want to thank this team, thank my collaborators, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Professor, so much for a super exciting and uh, insightful talk. Uh, and for those, uh, maybe shall we just unmute and uh, give the, our guest of speaker like, a round of applause. Um, so uh, Professor uh, Monica Shai smith has uh, generously agreed to take uh, questions and also to uh, meet and chat with students uh, now in the form of an extended Q&A session. Uh, this is just to keep the tradition of uh, meeting and uh, having dinner with students. So uh, for those of you in the audience who uh, uh, is out of time, uh, thank you so much for participating. And for those of you who have questions, uh, please feel free to ask. Uh, Laura, Shomek, and I will also be monitoring the chat box. So if you want to put your question there, that's also OK. Yeah, thank you so much. So I, I see a hand up. Um, yeah, that's yeah, me. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks. Uh, excellent talk. I, I learned a lot. Um, I was curious, you didn't mention anything about uh, disorder in the couplings of all these coupling graphs. Experimentally speaking, like, do you, are you fighting very hard to make all of these couplings the same? Or is this something that graduate students spend lots of time on and you just didn't tell us for brevity? Or is it like a... Uh, is it like relatively easy? Like how, how much is disorder a problem to actually make the graphs you're interested in? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so, and in particular, uh, on 